if you have not had a chance to see this interview, you're going to see three parts of it tonight. There's three pieces here that I want to show you. So the Gray Zone interviewed Matt Taibbi. Obviously, they talked to him about the Twitter files. That's the hot topic right now with uh, Matt Taibbi. And there were a couple of things that they mentioned here that I think would be good for you to know. I've gotten questions from you guys. It's really interesting. Like people have asked me these questions and I'm like, I really don't know. The, <laughs> I don't know myself. But um, one of the questions that you guys have have either emailed me or DM me asking me about this particular project here that Matt Taibbi and a couple other journalists have been working on as well is what exactly was the process? How were people chosen? What is it like working with Elon Musk? What were some of the other things that they found? So Matt Taibbi actually did uh, answer some of these questions in this interview. I do feel like, and I've seen other interviews um, with him about this issue, but I feel like this particular interview went a little bit further. This interview was over an hour and 30 minutes long. So they did talk about more here. So let's go ahead and get into it. So first up, what was the process in reference to the Twitter files? How were people selected? These types of questions that you guys have been asking, he's going to answer those. So let's go ahead and get into it. Thank you about the process by which you got these files and how you go about collating them and determining, first of all, what to ask for, what to look for, and what to report. So I, without being, without talking out of school too much about some of the arrangements that I might have had um, in terms of like attribution and think, you know, that sort of thing, um, I didn't go to them. I, I was, I was approached, uh, you know, by Twitter and um, that was, I was the first person uh, and the basically the, the original idea was just to open up everything that was at Twitter. Uh, um, the original story was going to be about um, the release of the, the, the blocking of the Hunter Biden story. Now, here, here's. So let's just pause there for a second and let's just interject there. So that piece is important. He didn't contact them. They contacted him. Uh, the original first piece was going to be the Hunter Biden story. So let's just keep that all in mind, especially when people say that PR stunt that went around. Oh, my God, look at Matt Taibbi working for doing PR for the richest man in the world. Like that was ridiculous. But listen, uh, listen to this as well. So I should talk about, I, I guess, my thought going into this whole process was, wouldn't it be fascinating to find out what kind of a relationship companies like Twitter might have with, you know, the federal government if they are told by the White House to, to or by the FBI to lay off stories. That would be it would be great if we could learn that. And so yeah. I picked I picked the Hunter Biden story, thinking that that's where we, we might see it um, if it existed. Um, it turned out it wasn't in that first batch, um, and that was maybe because, as we subsequently found out that batch was um, being reviewed by the deputy general counsel and former FBI uh, general counsel, Jim Baker, uh, plus an outside law firm. And um, once those folks exited the scene, uh, then we had a new regime that involved um, basically all, there was, there were some other reporters involved by then. And we would, we would send out, um requests to an off-site attorney in the company uh and then they would turn over those requests fairly quickly uh, so we can't say with ab absolute certainty what we're getting what we're not getting um but what i would say is my instinct is that they're turning this stuff over so fast that they couldn't possibly be collating it um that much or or, or that intently why is that piece important? The turnaround time. The faster the documents are turned over to Matt Taibbi and the other journalists that are involved in this as well, the less time they have to doctor any of these items. The less time they have to, uh, let's go ahead and remove a couple of emails. Let's remove a couple of documents. Uh, let's not show them that part. 
So the, the turnaround time, the fact that it was a fast turnaround time, that's important. So I, I wanted you guys to hear that from people saying, oh, they just selectively chose certain things or how do we know that what they gave them was true? Think about what he said about how fast the turnaround time was. Okay. Um, Aaron, but, feel free to jump in. Yeah, and just quickly on that, like the, the, these would be the the way we would do it would be like a very broad search request. We would identify four or five executives we thought we were were important executives, and then we would ask for search terms like, um, you know, Russia or uh, um. um Julian Assange, things like that, right? Like yeah. we, we, we and we would see what would come up, and then sometimes if something came up, we would ask for to follow up on that. Search terms that piece is important as well. So that answers the Julian Assange question. I think I've seen him ask um, someone else asking this question before about did anything come up in reference to that. So far, it hasn't. Uh, but the search term piece is important. That's how they were able to get the information that they got. So let's go on. And was anything off limits? And also people in the chat are, I mean, a number of commenters are asking if there's a way to release the source material the way WikiLeaks did. Uh, I, that's been discussed. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's po that's a possible um, uh, ending to this whole thing. I, I think the concern... Um, from the company's point of view is that is that they still inherit the liability of the old company uh so the, the lawyers right, in this situation right. i don't i don't feel for them they're in a very difficult spot because they've they've essentially been instructed to do everything that they went they've, they've spent their whole lives being told um not to do like you know give important damning documents to journalists willy-nilly and um so that's possible, but I think you know that's that that decision is a little bit above my pay grade. I think, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that that question was probably asked is about the original source is because I mean they're all journalists, and that is something that they do have to deal with is the original source, uh, especially if you're writing an article like you. You do have to do that. So sometimes people may ask, like, is there any way that people can find out who the original source was? Uh, so they have something to, I don't know, something to back up their claim and say, well, yes, this is the source. Uh, but so far, it looks like not too certain about that. So let's get into uh, some of the latest threads, Matt, which have to do with Russiagate. And just to catch people up on the story so far, because uh, Max and I covered this last week uh, on our Gray Zone live stream of what's been revealed. The short story is basically the files, the Twitter files reveal a lot of pressure on Twitter from Democratic Party operatives and U.S. intelligence officials to basically validate Russiagate, to come up with material that can uh, – justify the claims that Democrats and intelligence officials have been making that Russia is waging the sweeping social media influence operation. And the theme that comes back again and again and again is that Twitter tries very, very hard to find something, to find these Russian bots, to find Russian actors being responsible for uh, misinformation and for uh, viral uh, claims, but they just can't find anything. And that is very frustrating to the Democratic operatives and the intelligence officials that are putting pressure on them. So the, one of the latest threads you have is about this, ha this hashtag release the memo. And that had to do with basically back in 2018, you have some oversight being done by the House Intelligence Committee under the leadership of Devin Nunes. And they uh, wrote a memo detailing serious abuses by the FBI in their surveillance warrant applications on Carter Page, who was a Trump campaign volunteer. And Nunes uh, and Cash Patel, who was working for him, basically discovered that the FBI was lying to the FISA court. It was hiding the fact that the Steele dossier was funded by the Clinton campaign, even though it was citing the Steele dossier as its main source for wiretaps of a Trump campaign volunteer, Carter Page. It also was lying about the fact that it hadn't corroborated any of the information in the Steele dossier. And so mm -hmm. Nunes wrote a very critical memo about that. And for that, he was pilloried by Democrats and the media. And there was a hashtag called release the memo, which is basically encouraging the release of the Nunes memo. And 
at the time, you had something called the Hamilton 68 dashboard, which Max wrote about. Max, you can say more about this in a second. Basically saying that this release the memo hashtag and this criticism of the Steele dossier, that all this was really the work of these nefarious Russian actors. So you have now new information about how Twitter went and looked for some information to substantiate this and came up empty. So um, talk to us about what happened here. And if I've missed anything or got anything wrong, uh, please feel free to to correct me. No, that that's that's pretty much exactly right. And I think the really the really damning thing about this is that you know uh, Twitter for the most part the this was 2018, so they were already um, used to this cycle of being asked to uh, verify claims of uh, foreign interference. I just have to chime in here really quick and remind you guys: don't forget to hit that smash. Smash that like button. One more thing I want to add in here, too. I don't know if anyone has noticed this, but Jacobin has released uh, a new article uh, that says that Hillary Clinton lost in 2016. Uh, duh. I mean, we know we know that. But at the same time, what they go on to say is that the whole Russiagate idea was that this was not real. <laughs> that this had nothing to do with it at all and that she just legitimately actually lost. I don't think it's a coincidence that that article came out after the release of the Twitter files. So it's like now that it's all out there and like Matt Taibbi, they've done different segments of these Twitter files, different categories. One of the categories was Russia Gate. And it just seemed, it was interesting to me that after that came out, then it was okay for Jacobin to write the article and say, oh yeah, by the way, Russia Gate <laughs> had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. She just legitimately lost. Isn't that interesting? Funny how these things work out when people get that, they get that thumbs up, that okay. But in this case, it wasn't even like, well, we only found a few. It was literally, we didn't find any. Um, and there was a, uh, there's an incredible quote in there. And just give you, if you give me a moment, I can find it. This is Yoel Roth, uh, who is the head of trust and safety at, um, at Twitter and basically kind of the chief censor who, you know, had emerged as kind of a villain in, in this story because he was very aggressive um, in, you know, tw uh, censoring uh, a lot of conservative material. But here he looks at the stuff and he says, I just reviewed the accounts that posted the first 50 tweets with the hashtag release, uh, with hashtag release the memo, and none of them show any signs of affiliation to Russia. Um, and he talks about how I think we can push back very strongly on this. Uh, there's just one email after the other where they talk about how they're not fine. Not only are they not finding much, they're not finding anything. And they but they were pushed to find something, even though they weren't finding anything. This is the thing when we went through all of like the Twitter files and everything on here. I don't know how many of them I've done so far right now. Like some have been done on RBN. Some have been done here. I don't know how many I've done. But one of the things with this particular issue is even though Twitter kept replying saying that we have not found anything or very little, they were still being pushed to come up with something. To come up with something, you know, isn't that crazy? This is how propaganda works. Like, no, you gotta, you gotta find something so that we can, we can scare the people. This is crazy. Now, that's that piece. Oh, let me finish this piece here, and then I'm gonna go they second. They tell part. this to uh, the staffers. They tell this to Diane Feinstein's staff. They tell this to Richard Blumenthal's staff. They tell this to Adam Schiff's staff. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have any effect. They just go ahead and and run with this. They they publish uh, public letters about Russian influence, and then there's just an army of private media organizations, none of whom responded to requests for comment. By the way, and that's Diane Feinstein. But only after Feinstein published her letter about Russian influence, so she was complicit too. Uh, one of the things I can say about these files that has been very revealing, again, some of us that are, uh, you know, content creators, commentators, et cetera, we had a feeling that this was happening with Twitter. They were suppressing certain voices, but we just didn't have actual evidence, right? Well, now we do, uh, thanks to the Twitter files. But one of the things that was really disturbing to me was to see 
politicians be able to tell social media companies what they should and should not have on uh, certain accounts that should be removed. Adam Schiff was uh, one of them. We talked about him recently as well. That is very disturbing. And it makes you wonder what kind of United States do we actually live in? The fact that someone who is a politician can actually determine what is put out, what message is put out on a social media platform, whether you own the company or not, just like that, they can come in and tell you to take it down. They can come in and tell you to remove certain accounts. This is another example to show you that it's not just mainstream media that is very much controlled. It's not just mainstream media that is heavily propagandized, but it's also social media. Because you see Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, what's the other one the kids like to do? Oh, the TikToks, whatever you want to call it. Like all this stuff is controlled. There are certain narratives that they allow to get out and there are certain narratives that they suppress. And usually if it's being suppressed, it's something that they don't want the masses to hear, whether it's true or not. It's all controlled, all of it. Not just mainstream media, also social media. So hopefully this makes people much more aware. Now there's another part I wanted to go to here because I had timestamps for this. Oh, 40, right. We're going to go over to 40, the 40 minute mark, right about here. Yeah. But no, this, this meant, I think this meant a lot in, in the moment because it, it told us they could get away with all kinds of stuff. And um, it also told us that the, that the, the tech companies um, knew enough not to, to squawk publicly. Uh, mm. So that, you know, that, that was significant also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's move on to another hilarious aspect of this whole. Uh, the, 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 one of them, I, I would say the most hilarious thread. And. Is this the one? Yeah, this should is. be the it, one about it, it Adam Schiff. To, um, right. Shifty Schiff. <laughs> Adam Schiff. <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. OK, this is the beginning of the thread. Just Adam Schiff ban request. So basically, Adam Schiff's office was behind a lot of this. A lot they were driving the RussiaGate related social media censorship yep. campaign and putting in requests for Twitter to ban certain accounts. Which account did they want to ban? His own office, you guys. This is what I talked about on Sunday. Adam Schiff's own office. They were actually contacting Twitter and telling them to ban certain accounts. What kind of craziness is this? And he was also a big Russia gator. So you got to put the pieces, you got to line all these pieces up together, line all of them up. They, they so wanted to last week that they wanted to ban the journalist, Paul Sperry, who outed the name of the CIA official who was known as the whistleblower in Trump's first impeachment inquiry, who complained about Trump's phone call with Zelensky. So Paul Sperry outed him in real clear investigation. Right. So Trump want so so Schiff wanted him banned, and he also wanted uh, content, any content on Twitter related to an, a, a staffer on his committee. He also wanted that censored uh, because, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, man. Yeah, the, you can see actually lower in this thread. Um, th there's a uh, <laughs> there's a there's a quote about um, how far they went in um, in, in asking for. Uh, you know, for, for, uh, help with this, uh, hang on a second. I got, I, I want to find it because it's just such a, a crazy, uh, thing. Everything is like, they'll just say anything is QAnon that they want to ban. This is QAnon related. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. They said it was Even QAnon not. related and, and, you know, the, the logic that they use, um, uh, for that is crazy, but they asked for among other things, like the complete suppression of any and all search results about Mr. Misko, who is, one of the staffers for uh, Schiff and other committee staffers. So they wanted that. So this tells me that they knew a lot about how Twitter's um, visibility filtering programs work because they can do that. They can suppress uh, search yep. results. Yeah, and Twitter um, Twitter obeyed and said we are uh, de-amplifying these accounts. Speaking of Twitter suppressing search results, you can test this for yourself. There are some accounts, people who I happen to 
follow <laughs> on Twitter. And I don't want to say their names on here because I don't want to put them on blast like that. But there are some of them, I test this out re recently, even if you enter their handle, they don't show up. They don't show up. I mean, Case Study QB has talked about this before on this show about how um, his page, which is crazy, Case of all people, how his page had like this warning label. If you went to his page, like warning, this could be sensitive content, which it's not. <laughs> I don't know how he got that label, but it happened. But there are other people I know of, and I've tested this recently. If you enter their handle uh, in Twitter, they don't come up. Yes, search suppression exists. Which I'm, sh I'm, I'm deamplified. I'm sure of it. If I were amplified, it's like every time John Brennan farts and coughs, he gets eighty thousand likes. He's like exactly. Donald Donald Trump leads it. His first tweet was like, Donald Trump is the leader of a cacistocracy. And it got like <laughs> 7 million likes or something. He'd never tweeted before. And so. now what is, the, what is the significance of this guy, Misko? Like, why would Adam Schiff want to have search results ab uh, about him suppressed? Well, Paul Sperry, uh, so he, he, he allegedly had a re the relationship with Eric Chiramella who was the quote unquote yeah, whistleblower yeah. in the U yeah. in the Ukraine affair. Yeah. And um, there were multiple tweets uh, that came out that were basically Sperry reporting. Um, but the, the shift's office wanted any, anything to do with Chiramella um, and or Misko's background. Look, there's reporting that Misko has a CIA background. I, I haven't, uh, confirm that myself, but that's in some of these tweets. Um, so they were mad about that, but they were also mad about things like, um, you know, you see there's a tweet there. Uh, well, that's what uh, I wanted to bring up. I wanted to bring up this, uh, yeah, go this, ahead. This, yeah, I wanted to bring up the, this one because this is this is the most hilarious aspect. So Adam Schiff basically wanted to, uh, Take, have Twitter take down tweets uh, by a Pete Douche parody photo of Joe Biden. Yeah. Oh, okay. This yeah, is like no, a I know. It's a funny account. Nate's liver commentary. I follow this account. And yeah, this, this somehow upset Adam Schiff so much, this photo and this tweet. <laughs> and now here's a question to ask yourself. If this was a photo of Donald Trump, you know, it's, it's like a meme, like, does Adam Schiff not mean? Does he not know how to meme? Like, I don't know. But imagine if it was a photo of Donald Trump where they were making fun of his face. Would Adam Schiff have pressed them to take down that account? Probably not because it wouldn't be his party. But since it's someone from his political party, he wanted them to take it down. A meme for Christ's sakes. This is how far they have actually gone. Are you kidding me? Jeez Louise. It's really actually angry. animated. If you, if you if you if you look for if you if you enter the the, the tweet, it it uh, the tongue kind of moves around a little bit, and uh, <laughs> it's even funnier. I mean, why really... the people of California elected Adam Schiff to spend his time <laughs> taking down tweets like this? This is <laughs> right? really top issue for voters. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. The taxpayer resources going to. This was on. Do they were doing this during office hours? Yeah. This is hilarious. Mm -hmm. I mean. Okay, here's no, the request. This is what they're doing with their, this is what the politicians are doing with their time. Like all that money that you donate to them to put them in office. This is what they're doing with their time. They're like the police, they're like the police officers that spend more time at Dunkin' Donuts and chilling in the car than actually, actually solving crimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. DNC and, reached and, out to morning about a different tweet and the same image, but different. Yeah, uh, but so textual context, and it's it's like CC'd to all of these executives. It's this is yeah, no, it's like shot. every every senior lawyer in the company had to deal with this. <laughs> um, but it's the fact that this is how dangerous it is. It has become right, like to this point where you can't even make fun of certain people. Uh, a politician may get mad. You made fun of someone from their party. Take it down. I mean, it's just the censorship. It all goes back to censorship again. It's like. But, you know, what is Adam Schiff's job? What is he really supposed to be doing? Like, what is he in D.C. to do if he's spending his time doing this? What a joke, man. I, I don't get it at all. And 
look, a lot of people have, have been critical of the Twitter files in this project because they think that we're quote unquote cherry picking or showing only one side of things. Just to give you an example of um, of how this worked, like I, I ran searches for Yoel Roth, the lawyer Stasha Cardiel, who it turns out I think it feels like she was running the company. Like everybody seems to be deferring to her, even even lawyers on, uh, technically on uh, ahead of her. Um, there was a policy director named Lauren Culbertson. So I, I picked all the senior um, officials, and then I ran a search for DNC and RNC. Right. On the off chance that. Let's pause there for a second. So for people who continue to ask me the question, did he only look for, you know, Democrat information, Republican information? So he just explained he ran a search for DNC and for RNC. So I'm, I'm glad that this is being cleared up because there have been a, a, a lot of people actually that have been smearing Matt Taibbi uh, recently saying that he was only looking for information that would you know, basically harm Democrats. And I mean, I didn't believe that to be true, uh, but you just heard him tell you that he looked for both. So. There were also requests coming in from the RNC to, to get rid of stupid pages. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it didn't turn up that like what you get from the DNC is just this pile of requests to get rid of, mostly really stupid things like you know <laughs> people saying you sh hey republicans go out and vote on wednesday or whatever it is right yeah um but you know occasionally it's something like this where it's legitimately a parody and they have to take their time out and explain to the dnc that you know we don't do that you know this is this is like speech and they're not understanding that on the RNC side, I'm not seeing it. In instead, what you see from the RNC are these constant letters saying, we're going to sue you if you keep doing this kind of stuff to us. So in other words, whether it's because the uh, the Republicans didn't think they, they would get away with it if they were if they wrote to Twitter, um, or whether it's because there was a genuine difference in, in how they viewed this kind of thing, there just, there just wasn't you know, a flip side to the story where you're where you're seeing similarly stupid stuff coming from the Republican side. Well, the Republicans can't call on their buddies inside. Right. That was uh, pretty revealing, right? When it came to that kind of stuff, he didn't see it on the Republican side. And he could probably say this a thousand times and people will still like smear him because they don't like the fact that he's saying negative things about the Democratic Party. Unfortunately, that's how some people are. That's all they see is like it's negative things about Democratic Party. How dare you? You must be secret right wing. <laughs> building like Emily Horn or whoever who used to work for the uh, for Obama. Like, so what other option do they have? Or Jim Baker, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Jim Baker is the perfect example. And yeah. just uh, really quickly, I mean, you found what was it? Was it you who found the tweet? Show, or the, the the file demonstrating that Jim Baker was presiding over uh, censorship and suppression requests from inside Twitter HQ. Uh, you mean you mean about the Twitter files? Yeah. No, that was Barry actually who found that out. Um, okay. So, so she was in the office, and, <laughs> and some employee she she asked about she had made a request about something, and she asked uh, somebody in the office. Hey, what's up with that request? And uh, the employee said, um, "It's coming. I just got to ask Jim." And she's like, "Jim, who?" And she uh, Barry did a good job. She she beat it out of this report. This this employee like you know the, a phone number. She calls the phone number, and the voice on the other end of the line finally admits that his name is Jim Baker. And this is this is how we discovered that um, mm -hmm. Jim Baker was in the middle of um you know reviewing this material subsequently they they accidentally sent us some other things that um gave me a little bit more of a window like there was an outside law firm that was brought in in addition to jim baker um yeah so that's that and he's referring to uh barry weiss when he says barry by the way uh let me go ahead and fast forward to the last piece that i wanted to play because like I said, I'm not playing the, obviously I'm not going to play the whole video. 
Um, but there were a couple of parts here. I did want to pick out, um, was it this piece? I think it was right around here. Yeah. Uh, well, what do you mean by that? It haven't aroused the excitement you thought that. Well, you know, I, I like I would, I might have thought he would have been like, wow, that's all. I mean, he, he, he he, he sometimes he is like that right like i mean i i can't i can't talk about a lot of this because it's, it's, it's these are all off the record conversations um yeah. but you know he's he's got a lot of stuff going on like the company's losing you know bucket loads of money and there's dynamics that i don't understand going on like i know i i know for sure because i've been told by other people in the company that our presence there is deeply resented and is considered like you know potentially um you know destructive to the entire venture and so there are people who are worried about their jobs and, and, and um he's talking about elon musk the part that's right before this he says that um he was i guess in a way he was kind of surprised that like some of the information that he found that elon musk wasn't as as shocked or like whoa whoa like that's exciting like kind of the way that we were <laughs> like when this information started coming out, i was like holy crap <laughs> like oh my god what's coming next it's coming this way like <laughs> that's how we were um but i guess he he was kind of surprised that some of the information that they found that they released he expected elon musk to be more i guess excited about and he wa wasn't necessarily excited about some of the information so that's what he's talking about there and are looking at us like you know we're we're our our presence there is a mere presence there is an insult so is that working on his mind too right like i don't i don't know um it, it's it's hard it's it's really hard to say obviously you're right he is a defense contractor um mm -hmm. you know and and we are finding things that um that probably wouldn't be popular with with people who would be inclined to give out defense contracts so you know we'll we'll, yeah, look, we'll find out when he when he when he turns when he turns the faucet off we'll find out but so has far has anyone uh, been stopped from reporting anything to no your knowledge no, and, no I, and I, how, not, okay did you guys hear that part max blumenthal asked has anyone been stopped from from reporting anything they said no so listen to this not not to my knowledge i haven't been so okay and, and how are you invited and how how is everyone invited i mean i would i find it kind of ironic that i guess barry weiss is playing this role now as an adversarial figure that she's heavily involved in censoring and attempting to suppress uh palestinian academics and palestine palestine related activists who i knew this was going to come up <laughs> yeah i told you guys barry weiss um uh, from what i've seen from her it's been cringe like to me she kind of came across as like your standard neoliberal uh she is not for the palestinian movement she has been very vocal about that she said some cringe things in reference to the palestinian movement as well um so i knew that was going to come up but the question that he's asking here is how were you guys selected like long story short like how was this you know how did they decide to pick you and and Barry Weiss and Lee Fang and uh, Schreinberger and I forget the other. There's another one to shoot, but uh, they keep adding more people to this list. So how did they make that decision? That's what Max is asking here. Want to speak out? Uh, she led the campaign against Joseph Massad at Columbia. She is someone I would have associated with the, the neoconservative movement, which is now invested deeply in censoring these sorts of opinions like i don't know if she stepped away it's not like i've had some conversation with her <laughs> um but uh it's ironic and i don't i guess no i don't know if anyone's going to be looking into twitter banning countless palestine related accounts um well i would look how, at it i mean i've written about that a lot in the past yeah. um I, I, but, but I, how I, how was everyone chosen i mean they're, i'm not saying you're a conservative journalist but there does seem to be a certain um political through line and a sense of shared sensibility among those who were chosen well i think i think mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is that none of us are with the exception i guess of lee who still technically works at the intercept um you know none of us have a connection to traditional uh corporate media that's important to note so the people that were selected are 
technically they're all independent journalists. I know some people may say, well, Barry Weiss, New York Times, remember Barry Weiss left the New York Times. There was this whole like interview process about that. She talked to Joe Rogan about that. I think I may have reported on that at that point in time when it happened. I don't know. It's been a while, but, um, just to keep that in mind, with the exception of Lee Fang, Lee Fang does write for The Intercept. I'm not sure if he's a regular staffer or if he's a contributor. I'd have to go and check. Uh, but so far, all of them are independent. Anymore, right? Uh, so that's probably the first thing. I, you know, I'm, my guess is that that he he uh, wanted this to be a burn on traditional corporate press and and uh and it i think it has been so uh but i i don't have any insight into i mean it sounds like he went with people who he trusts which is which is how it works i mean that's that's where people get sources from is, is if the source trusts them and uh i mean i just or come he's back a fan and, of them i mean yeah right. or if he yeah, i'm sure uh but um but uh and also um for yeah. me what what matters is is the material accurate or not and is it newsworthy and just i mean the washington post is owned by a defense contractor but if the washington post had a explosive story which they have sometimes uh, and they expose you know they've exposed war crimes for example in afghanistan they had a big series recently about uh u.s files and how the u.s covered up the progress of the war in afghanistan it's still it's it's valuable on its merits and uh that that that's just the reality of of the media environment that we're in is just like our we, we have our overlords they control our institutions and the hope is that sometimes some factual information can get out uh within the, within those constraints and i think with it I'm, I'm gonna add something here then i'll let aaron finish and we'll go to the next story in reference to who elon musk chose i'm gonna go out on a limb here and say he's probably not gonna pick someone who he would consider to be on the far left. And I hate saying that phrase, but I don't know how else to describe it. But he, he probably wouldn't pick someone that he considers to be on the far left. So like he wouldn't pick, number one, I'm not a journalist per se. I've written one article. He would never pick me. Like he wouldn't pick, um, give me somebody, throw me someone out in the chat. Like he probably wouldn't pick people from Black Agenda Report. He probably wouldn't pick, I'm just, just go on with me here. He probably wouldn't pick Danny Haifong. He probably wouldn't pick Margaret Kimberly. He probably is not going to pick someone that he considers to be on the far left. And, and same thing for the, what he says is the far right. He probably isn't going to pick uh, someone like that because I, and I say this because I've seen him be very critical about both of those sides uh, on Twitter and in interviews as well. Yes. Nick Nugent, Chris Hedges, right. He's probably not going to crit. You guys are naming names. <laughs> He's probably not going to pick um, like Chris Hedges, uh, Whitney Webb's another one. He's probably not going to go with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what I would imagine. I'm going to let uh, Aaron finish and then we're going to go to the next Twitter story. files so far. Uh, there's been a lot of great material as we've talked about today. Yeah. And, and he's, you know, um, certainly this stuff isn't coming out if, if this guy doesn't buy the company uh, for $44 billion or whatever it is. And, uh, he, he, you know, I'm sure there's stuff that's come out that hasn't been um, pleasant for him, right? Uh, and he hasn't shut it down yet. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't have to be thankful for that. It's not my job to be thankful for that. Like, uh, but it's... Uh, I, I think on the whole, it's a net plus, like as long as the information is coming in, it's a tremendous opportunity, um, not just for me, but for any journalist to, to, to look at this, this information and, and cross reference it with other things that have come out, other leaks, other, other types of, um, investigative reports. And, um, so I, 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 I think it's been a good thing and, and, um, you know the question of motive it's it's funny how people only selectively bring that up to me <laughs> as, as far as i'm concerned like you know sources always have motives and and you know we, we, what's important is what our motives are um when, when we look at the material and the only i think the only ethical question for me is if i ever get the sense that this that the stuff i'm being sent is not what it's been represented 
um, then then I'm going to have a, 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 an ethical moment where I'll, I'll have to say, I can't do this anymore. Or I can't say that um, this right. is a representative batch or whatever. Right. Like, so. Good point there, Matt, um, which I don't I think we would expect him to to not do something like that anyway. But uh, definitely go check out that that full interview. Like I said, the interview is pretty long. Um, so definitely go ahead and, and check that out when you get a chance. Adam Koch says, Savvy, those are the same people who still think Russia Gate is true. <laughs> Brent says, apparently congressmen and women are just internet hall monitors. <laughs> what? <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> 